Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you. You are our King and our Redeemer. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. All right. What a glorious day. Well, did you guys know that the more junk food you eat, the more junk food your body will crave? I think we all know that. We all know that from experience. Um, but research, of course, backs us up. What we know, the scientists confirm. Junk food has been designed to stimulate pleasure centers in our brain, and it's also designed to leave us empty, wanting more until we've eaten way too much. Isn't that crazy? Junk food is designed that way so that we, we don't <clears throat> get full until we are too full, and then we feel miserable. A publication of the Cleveland Clinic put it this way, and here I quote, the brain's reward processing system for food is like its mechanisms related to substance abuse. Sugar makes us want to eat more sugar. Fat makes us want to eat more fat. Our brains are chasing that pleasurable state of food euphoria, end quote. <clears throat> and the really crazy part is that food companies know this. They know this and they know it very well. And so they have permanent research labs working to make current foods more addictive and to create new foods that will give us greater momentary delight and long-term dissatisfaction. They are actually diabolical. They are diabolical, okay? They wanna keep us hungry. They want us to not be satisfied. Uh, and isn't that a great metaphor for life? They may as well call these labs addiction departments because that is essentially what they are. Big food manufacturers capitalize on our weaknesses. They have flooded our culture with cheap and unhealthy food and they know that if we merely try to resist, we will fail. We cannot just resist. And the point is this, we cannot get healthy by merely limiting our intake of unhealthy food. It just does not work. If all we have on the menu is unhealthy food, we cannot just resist unhealthy food and keep ourselves from being unhealthy. However, there is a solution and it's really simple. To overcome a craving for unhealthy food, don't just resist unhealthy food, fill yourself up with healthy food. <laughs> there you go. In fact, the same studies that point out the addictive properties of junk food also tell us that the best way to fight bad food addiction is to replace junk food with healthy food. And scientists call this gene reprogramming. And they insist that, and here I quote again, if you can find ways to gradually eat healthier, you will start to experience the crazy cravings of junk food less and less. And so um, the science tells us, and the common wisdom has always been, Eat healthy proteins and vegetables, drink plenty of water, get enough sleep, and our cravings for junk food just get squeezed out. There's not much room for them left. They begin, in other words, to take care of themselves. And so this is a simple time-tested rule for physical health, but it's equally true for our spiritual health. If we want to grow spiritually, if we want to become more like Jesus Christ, becoming healthier and more settled in Jesus Christ, then we will fail if we focus only on resisting temptation. We know the things that we don't want to do. We know the things that we don't need to do. We know what the consequences of doing these things over and over again is. But if all we do is try over and over again to resist, we will fail. If our approach to spiritual growth, in other words, is mostly negative, focus, for instance, on being less angry, less gossipy, less lustful or greedy or jealous, you name it. Whatever you struggle with most, you will not overcome your sins if your only strategy is to resist them. We cannot resist our way into the kingdom of God. It just does not work. So what can we do? Well, we need to focus first on a healthier spiritual diet. If we want to grow in Christ, then our approach must first be positive. And this is what Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount. 
In fact, he makes it very clear in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, when he says to his disciples, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. In other words, all the little daily struggles will just kind of melt away if we positively focus on those things that are good and right and true. And in our epistle reading, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, St. Paul unpacks this idea, giving it a theological context. Listen carefully to the apostle's message. He writes in verses 1 through 2, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Seek first the kingdom of God. Clearly, Paul echoes Jesus in Matthew 6 here. This is his way of saying the same thing again. Seek the kingdom. Seek the righteousness of Christ. Put all your energy into that. Focus on that. And your other concerns will fall into place. So, in other words, don't worry too much. It's a hard message. It's hard to believe and it's hard to settle ourselves in. But don't worry too much about resisting the world. We cannot overcome the world. But the good news is we do not have to overcome the world. And we really don't. All the burden is not placed on our shoulders because Jesus has already overcome the world. So seek Jesus and his goodness. Our greatest temptations will lose their hold on us if we seek the things above. In fact, when we seek Christ first, we discover that those things tempting us were never worthy of our attention to begin with. And so just as our desire for junk food loses its strength as we learn to eat real food, so will our desire for the things above grow as we learn to see that they are the real deal. They are the substance. The gifts of God are the true objects of all of our longings. Those things that tempt us are mere shadows or imitations. They're like fake food, and they do not satisfy. You know, Christians have always said, and have said forever, that we have all been born with a natural desire for the goodness and for the glory of God. And so that's why we all experience life as continual longing. We are hungry, and we know that we experience life that way. as a kind of continual chasing after satisfaction. And what we find, of course, is that we cannot be satisfied, especially in those things which are not spiritually healthy. We just want more and we want more and we want more. And the reason for that is because we have been made for God. And only in God do we find rest. In his beautiful sermon, The Weight of Glory, C.S. Lewis captures the essence of this principle. He writes this. He said, our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. Well, just think about that for a while, okay? Those of us who are sometimes boiling with desire, you know, desires that cannot be satisfied, don't have a problem of too much desire. We have a problem of too little desire. Too little desire rightly placed on those things that can actually satisfy us. And so let me, let me start again. He says, our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is being meant, what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. And then he goes on and says, we are far too easily pleased. We are far too easily pleased. We set our sights too low. If we find in ourselves he says in another place, the desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, that it must be that we have been made for another world. We have been created for something more. And so let's take Paul's advice in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 through 8, and train ourselves for godliness. In other words, if we have a problem with desires which are too weak, how can we go about cultivating and strengthening those desires which will actually satisfy us? We train ourselves for godliness. And so let's train ourselves to desire those things worthy of our desire, those things that can actually bring us satisfaction and peace. And so moving on to Colossians chapter 3, verse 3, Paul explains the reality behind 
the principle that he is outlining. It is the reality of baptism, putting our sins to death on the cross so that we can obtain new life through the risen Christ. That is what is going on here. We've got desires that are too weak. They can be put to death, but only if we strengthen those desires which are rightly placed. Remember, Paul has just said, don't set your minds on things that are on earth because, and now we begin verse three, you have, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. So all the corruptions of this world have been nailed to the cross of Christ, we claim, and our attachments to them have died with them. And so we turn our attention to Jesus Christ. Having been baptized, our true life is hidden with Christ and God. And although we sometimes don't know what we need, if we will seek Christ, we find ourselves. When we find Christ, we are there too. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the story of a great exchange. And in Galatians 2.20, Paul explains this exchange this way. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ gave up his perfect, sinless life for us. He died on the cross on our behalf and asks only that we give up our chains for him. Just give up those things that you know are bad for you. That's all he asks. Give up the things about yourself that frustrate you most. He invites us to put off everything that saps us of life, deprives us of joy, and leads to our own deaths. And in return, Jesus gives us the substance of the life that he gave up for us. And so the idea that Christians believe is that Jesus literally gave his life for us. And so we can have that life. If we will just give up the life we already detest, it's a really good deal. It really is. So Christ, again, he gave up his life for us. We give up only our chains and we receive the life that he gave up. That is the Christian gospel in a nutshell. It's good news. So in other words, let's believe Paul when he writes in Colossians 3 verse 4, that when Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That is the positive goal, in other words. That is the real food that we need to strive for and begin feeding ourselves on so that the weaknesses will begin to fade away. Set your sights on Christ and the things above. The temptations of this world will lose their strength, and we will attain our heart's desire, those things that we have set our sights on. When we are raised with Christ in glory, we will find that it is Christ we wanted all along. And this isn't all pie in the sky. The process begins with our baptisms, and it continues through our lives. And so Paul continues after our passage for this morning in verses 5 through 10, telling the church to put to death what is earthly, things like fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. He says, put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and foul talk from your mouth. And how is it that you're going to do that? Well, he continues in verses 12 through 17 saying, essentially, you can put all of this off if you will put on Jesus Christ. Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ, he says, rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And then he concludes, and be thankful. In other words, this isn't, and I, I say this, it's not all our responsibility. Surround yourself with a community who puts Jesus Christ first, and we will find that the things of Christ become the culture within which we swim. Accept that grace. That's what he's saying. Just swim in a sea of grace, which is what the church is all about, even though it's hard to see. When a church puts Christ at the center, that precisely is what it is. So this Easter Sunday, uh, a day of celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, is also for us a day for celebrating baptism. Most of you guys know that today we are going to invite 12 children from this congregation to enter into this Christian life of putting off the things of this world in order to put on the things of Christ. And it is our job to help them along the way, to put the positive things before them, 
That's our job. In fact, in just a moment, I'm going to turn to the parents and I'm going to say these words. So please understand that we all share this burden to some degree. So when I say it to the parents, it's for all of us. This is what I will say as we begin the baptisms. I'll say today on behalf of this child, you shall make vows to renounce the devil and all his works, to trust God wholeheartedly and to serve him faithfully. It is your task to see that this child is taught as soon as he is able to learn the meaning of all these vows and of the faith that you will profess as revealed in the Holy Scriptures. But how do we do this? How do we go about helping our children put off the works of the devil and putting on wholehearted trust in God? I think we all know that we won't get far if all we do is rail against the works of the devil. It's kind of like trying to, to get healthy by simply resisting junk food. And I've got a lot of experience with this. <laughs> I can testify not only to junk food, but also to railing against all the things of this world that I'd like my kids to avoid. You can ask them. Um, John's shaking his head right now. <laughs> um, we live in a crazy world, you know, and I sometimes forget that it's always been that way. It's especially crazy these days, but it has always been crazy. There really is plenty to rail about. We could talk about injustice. We could talk about corruption. We could talk about sin all day long. There would be no end to the examples that we could offer. But that isn't what our kids need. Simply railing will not cut it. Or maybe we could take the approach of big box evangelicalism and try to package the gospel in the hippest, most entertaining forms. High quality pop music, big youth rallies, big name speakers and celebrities. We could give them lots of emotion and lots of drama so that at an early age, they make confessions of Christ whenever they are whipped up into an emotional state. And by the way, I find it fascinating, fascinating, uh, that just when evangelical Christianity began to embrace these patterns, which really sort of became overwhelming in the 1990s, doing all the things that I have just mentioned, young people started falling away. I don't know if you guys know this, but the Gallup company has been doing surveys for about 50 years now. Uh, they began in the, 19, in the early 1970s uh, doing surveys of Christianity. And from the year 1970 to about the year 2000, 70% of the American population was affiliated with some religious institution. Um, the vast majority were Christians, although we had Muslims and Jews always uh, also. However, in about the year 2000, that number began to decline precipitously so that the most recent Gallup poll, uh, which came out just a few days ago, showed us that fewer than 50% of all Americans now are affiliated with some religious institution. And that massive decline in the church affiliation of American citizens is driven primarily by young people. In other words, all the young kids who we took out of the adult services, you know, um, and began feeding with uh, a gospel of entertainment, uh, and I must say it, shallow Christianity, determined when they became adults that it just isn't believable. It isn't believable. And so among those people who are not going to church, it's the young people who make up the vast majority. So we cannot treat our kids like passive consumers of religious entertainment. It just will not work. So what can we do? Well, we can give our kids the gospel. We can give them a vision of what C.S. Lewis described metaphorically of a holiday at sea. We can show and explain how much better than mud pies the kingdom of God really is. In his brilliant little book, The Abolition of Man, and here I'll quote C.S. Lewis again. He lamented the fact that children are not being properly formed in Western culture. He compared this fallen world to a jungle full of all kinds of dangers to be avoided. But he suggested that the formative role of adults is not to cut down the jungles. The jungle will not be tamed, by the way, no matter how hard we rail against it. We can never clear away all the temptations and hazards that our kids will face. What we can do, according to Lewis, is irrigate deserts. These jungles, dangerous as they are, offer nothing life-sustaining. We can make that obvious to our kids, and at the same time, we can help and encourage them 
to positive growth, where there is most certainly a seed, a desire for God's truth and peace, we can add water. Because they are just like us, our children will be filled with all kinds of desires, passions, ambitions, loves. And we know that they will struggle to satisfy their longings, but we also know, because we are Christians and believers, that they will only ever find rest when they come to rest in God. And so don't give up, by the way, on your kids, because they get older. And as they get older, they fail over and over again, just like we do, just like we do. Uh, they find that the things of this world don't satisfy, and they keep looking, uh, just like we do. You see, God is the source of all longing, and only God can satisfy in the end. So don't give up on our kids. So in a world full of junk food that will never fill these children properly, we can give them good food to eat. Our kids are going to see broken families. In fact, I could go on and on about that. Over, well, <laughs> the family in America is broken. We can model for them a secure home, stable and trustworthy because a mother and a father know how to make promises and keep them. We can create in them a desire for the same kind of home. We can train them to never be satisfied with anything less. In a world where young girls are taught all kinds of conflicting messages, and poor girls, poor, poor young girls, on the one hand, encouraged to see themselves as little more than objects of male desire, and on the other hand, encouraged to find their worth in a career, just like men. It's not good advice for men or women, by the way. Mothers and all adult women can model for our young girls a different way. And all together, we can help our young women find their true gifts. We can guide them, in other words, to use those gifts and come to know their true worth in Christ Jesus by showing them the holiday at sea. And in a world where young men are ridiculed, written off as lazy, stupid, irresponsible, sitting in the basement playing video games, what more could they possibly be about? And worse than this, Fathers and all adult men can model a different way. We can teach responsibility, humility, self-sacrifice, and honor. We can work hard and we can love our families for them. We can live with purpose and help our sons grow and know their true worth in Christ so they do not end up settling with a worldly counterfeit. In so many ways, we are called to help our kids to put on Christ. It's the job we are all called to do. We're called to clothe them in the true dignity of Jesus Christ. So in short, we all have a part to play in helping these children see Jesus Christ and his kingdom. We all have roles to play in helping them live into their baptisms. And so in Colossians 3, verses 16 through 17, Paul wraps up his baptismal advice about putting off and putting on. And he basically says, if you want to seek the things above, if you want to put on Christ-like clothing, then keep Jesus Christ at the center of your fellowship. This is advice that we can definitely keep. So I'm going to let Paul have the last word here. He says, beginning in verse 16, these words, and these words that he gives us are things that we can do. It's what we're doing. It's what we will keep doing. Paul encourages the church to do this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. All glory, praise, and honor be to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.